Welcome to Aaron Menke's Cabinet of Curiosities, a production of iHeartRadio and Grim and Mild. Our world is full of the unexplainable. And if history is an open book, all of these amazing tales are right there on display, just waiting for us to explore. Welcome to the Cabinet of Curiosities. When times get tough, you can't just drop everything and abandon your responsibilities, right? No one is so free that they can leave their lives behind and start over in a new place with nothing to hold them back. Not unless their name is William Goodall, at least. William Arthur Bates Goodall was born in Manchester, England in 1880. After a brief school career in Bedford, he enlisted with the Manchester Regiment of the British Army at the age of 16. He earned two medals for fighting in the Second Boer War in South Africa until he was shipped out to Singapore in 1903. But the 23-year-old soldier had already grown pretty tired of fighting, so he withdrew from the army and became a civilian instead. He took on a few odd jobs here and there, like planting tea and mining for tin in Sumatra, but eventually found his way to the Singapore Municipal Commissioner's Water Department. He worked on some large projects, too, including the construction of some major reservoirs. Sometime in the early 1920s, Goodall and a few friends took a small boat out to explore the waters around Singapore. And in their excursion, they stumbled upon a small island in the Straits of Johor called Pulau Sarimban. The whole island measured about three and a half acres, with a large 60-foot-tall hill in its center. Goodall found it, and I quote, exceedingly attractive, and believed it to be the ideal place for bathing and picnic parties. He and his friends would visit often, climbing the hill to the top to admire the scenic views of the water. To the south in the distance was Singapore, and to the north was Johor Bahru, a city perched on the opposite shore. Pretty soon, Goodall found himself rowing out to Pulu Sarimban all the time. He even built a shack toward the top of the hill where he would hold parties for himself and his buddies. Then in 1932, the contracts on the Singapore reservoirs ended, and Goodall made a life-changing decision. He volunteered to live on that small island, permanently. He considered himself a Robinson Crusoe, named after Daniel Defoe's famous literary castaway. That was the life that William wanted for himself, one that he referred to as a delightfully peaceful existence. And it was for a while. His day consisted mainly of maintaining the land and the various equipment on the island. This included two dinghies, a mooring buoy, and his home, which he was constantly repairing. Goodall also tended to the fruit trees that grew on the island, and disposed of his trash each day by either dumping it into the sea or by burning it. But it didn't take long for that delightfully peaceful existence to take its toll on him. Between the endless stream of work to be done and the crippling loneliness, Goodall soon found himself in need of help and companionship. He hired two Chinese workers to handle the maintenance work on Pulau Sarimban, one worker to take care of the clerical work and a Javanese boatman. The four of them lived in peace until a British journalist named H. Harvey Day arrived on the island in 1937. He wanted to learn about Goodall's life there thus far. Harvey Day referred to it as a private kingdom, and pretty soon, William was fielding letters from all over the world, including Germany, New Zealand, and the United States, asking him about his self-imposed solitude. Now, it must be said that the article took some artistic license in how it portrayed his existence on the island, painting him as living inside some kind of fortification and holding back throngs of native people who were meant to harm him. But Goodall didn't pay too much attention to the rumors, and despite his solitary existence on the island, he still made frequent trips to the mainland to do radio interviews and speak about his life as an amateur Robinson Crusoe. William Goodall passed away in 1941 at the age of 61, but he will always be remembered for his role as the world's first voluntary castaway and the so-called King of Pulau Sarimban. Progress takes time. Innovation does not happen overnight. It requires a whole lot of trial and error to go from an idea to a fully formed concept. For example, did you know that canned foods were invented in the late 1700s, but the can opener itself didn't come around until the 1850s? And Alexander Bain's fax machine predates Alexander Bell's telephone by 33 years. 
But perhaps no one knew the slog of innovation better than Thomas Edison. Among his best-known inventions are the movie camera, the phonograph, and of course, the incandescent light bulb. It took a long time for Edison to complete what is widely considered his greatest accomplishment. As he once famously put it, I didn't fail a thousand times. The light bulb was an invention with a thousand steps. But the problem was that with each failed step, he was that much further away from a viable solution. And while he failed, other inventors were gaining steam. Patents were being filed all across Europe and the US by people with dreaming of harnessing electricity to light their homes and businesses. For example, English chemist Joseph Swan demonstrated his own incandescent light bulb around 1878. There were also a pair of Canadian inventors named Matthew Evans and Henry Woodward, who had patented a version of an incandescent bulb using a carbon rod filament four years earlier. Edison knew that it would be only a matter of time before his competitors cracked the formula and changed the future of electric-powered light forever. So he and his engineers got to work at the New Jersey lab, ceaselessly plugging away at different types of filaments until they found one that didn't burn out after a few minutes. To make matters worse, Edison was on a deadline. After he had unveiled his phonograph in 1877, he had promised the press that he would have a new, better invention one year later. The announcement resulted in scores of readers who bought issue after issue, hoping to get the inside scoop on Edison's latest and greatest. And so, one year later, as promised, the Wizard of Menlo Park delivered. He reached out to reporters and invited them for a first-hand look at his brand new invention, the incandescent light bulb. They were in awe, commenting on the beauty of its bright white light. One paper remarked, you could trace the veins in your hand and the spots and lines upon your fingernails by its brightness. Edison even told one journalist that it would burn forever. Well, almost. By all accounts, the bulb was a hit, and it was going to change the world. Eventually. There was just one little problem. It was fake. You see, Edison had to show the press something, not just to keep up his reputation, but also to get ahead of the competition. It had to be his name in the papers and no one else's. So what he came up with was a bulb that burned just long enough to appease the reporters before he hurried them off to file their stories. Once the demonstration was over, he continued searching for a proper filament that would burn indefinitely. But by showing the reporters his faux bulb, he had bought himself more time. Edison held another demonstration on New Year's Eve in 1879, just over a year since he had fooled the press. But this time, he had a light that did stay lit much longer. They used a carbon filament, which he had discovered in October of that year. The initial test at the time lasted just over 13 hours. The light bulbs we use today are the product of extensive trial and error conducted over a century by multiple innovators. Edison was not the sole inventor of the incandescent light bulb. He got the glory for the same reason he was able to fool everyone else, the power of the press. Edison was a master marketer and ran many of his competitors out of business due to his unscrupulous business practices. The more he got his name in the papers, the more successful he became. His stunt with the light bulb was no different. History books remember Thomas Edison as the genius behind many of the products we still use today. And he certainly was smart. But he actually perfected more than he invented, fine-tuning what was already out there and then commercializing it for the masses. The truth was that he was just a really good salesman. I hope you've enjoyed today's guided tour of the Cabinet of Curiosities. Subscribe for free on Apple Podcasts or learn more about the show by visiting curiositiespodcast.com. This show was created by me, Aaron Mankey, in partnership with How Stuff Works. I make another award-winning show called Lore, which is a podcast, book series, and television show. And you can learn all about it over at theworldoflore.com. And until next time, stay curious. Thank you.